just be able this morning to introduce you to a brother, a good friend of a brother of mine. Um, David and I met, uh, I think, on the sidewalk, if I'm not mistaken. I think we met at the sidewalk in front of the abortion clinics, uh, uh, preaching the gospel. And uh, no better place to meet, right? Amen. <laughs> you meet some faithful brothers and sisters out there. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, we've uh, ministered together uh, quite often throughout the last couple of years, uh, especially doing that. And I, I have to laugh because there was a couple of times where I was looking through pictures of, you know, the events that we had, especially in the winter, because uh, I got a little more girth on me than David does. So, but he wears a lot more clothes in the wintertime than I do. And it's funny, I was looking through pictures, and I thought that was me, but it was actually him. Both gray hair, gray beard, you know, we had sunglasses on, hats on. I was like, wait, where did I get that? that the, where did I get that coat at? Oh, wait, that's not me. Uh, but no, it was, uh, 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 but I, uh, it, it was funny. But anyway, uh, brothers and sisters, I'd like to introduce you to Pastor David Hewitt, pastor of Cruciform Church. David in the past has been a church planter. Uh, is currently pastoring uh, with uh, along with Pastor Jared, uh, Cruciform Church, and um, want to welcome you, brother, to this pulpit to share the gospel or share the share the word with us today. Thank you, brother. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Good morning. Good morning. I'm not quite accustomed to wearing one of these things. Usually in the afternoons when we meet, we don't have much amplification. I just talk really loudly, so maybe it'll be easier on my voice, so I'll get used to it. But I am privileged and blessed to be able to preach in Kipstead this morning as we're going to as we continue a look through the life and ministry of Jesus leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection and seeing what he's been doing with the preaching schedule that he has that he was shared with us. And I also know last week. My fellow pastor, Jared, who was here speaking, he brought a message about the woman at the well in Samaria, how Jesus confronted her and her sin, told her many a glorious truth and revealed himself to her and a great many in the town of Sychar. The harvest of souls came to him and the disciples after he saved her. It was a glorious thing. Today, we are going to be in John chapter 9, as you may have noticed if you've looked in your bulletin. So as, as I finish with the introduction here, if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9, We'll get into the text pretty quickly. It is a fairly long passage, and the outline summary I'm about to give you is going to reflect that, because in this account of the man born blind, the Apostle John gives us eight important truths that we cannot afford to miss. Yes, I said eight. There are eight major points in the message this morning. Eight important truths we can't afford to miss. Jesus had just been in the temple where he blasted the religious leaders for their hypocrisy, telling them that they were of their father, the devil, that they were not true children of Abraham because of how they were responding to him, and that he himself was God with the statement before Abraham was, I am. Such finishes out John chapter 8. They picked up stones to stone him. They knew what he was saying. He gave a powerful and bold confrontation of the lying and unbelieving religious establishment of his day. So in a way, this continues this morning, though indirectly, through a man who was born blind, and by the end of the account that we have in front of us, he is no longer blind, physically or spiritually. It truly is an amazing thing, and as I mentioned already, but say again, in this account of the man born blind, the Apostle John gives us eight important truths we cannot afford to miss. Let's read the text from John chapter 9, then we'll pray together and we'll get into our exposition today. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he's like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. 
They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, He put mud on my eyes, and I wash, and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he's opened your eyes? He said, He's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Such is the reading of the word of God. Let's pray together and we'll get into our exposition. Father God, thank you for giving us this time this morning that we might come before you to worship you, the one true God. Holy is your name and your word is holy and true. May we receive it well this morning and may I speak it clearly and boldly as I ought to speak the glory of your name, and the encouragement of your people. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. As I said, there are eight truths that the Apostle John records in this text, at least eight, and we're going to talk about them. The first is this. The first truth we see in the first two verses of John 9 is that not all suffering is the direct result of sin. Not all suffering is the direct result of sin. That word direct is important. We know that suffering came into this world because of sin originally. But not all the suffering that we experience individually is a direct result of our own sin. Verses 1 and 2. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. The setting of this chapter needs to be established first. We immediately see that Jesus passed by somewhere as he saw this man. Okay, passed by what? Well, the outer area of the temple is the most likely location. In fact, it's the only candidate that really makes sense. That's where Jesus was. If you turn back in your Bibles a couple of verses, back into John chapter 8, as I talked about during the introduction, you see this in verse 59. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. Jesus had just made the statement, before Abraham was, I am, a direct reference to the book of Exodus, where God says, I am who I am. The Pharisees knew what he meant. They picked up stones to stone him because they believed he was committing blasphemy. So he left, and they couldn't get to him. 
the outer area of the temple. The temple area itself, quite large. Not just a single structure, but an outer court and several other areas associated with it. And people gathered there for a great many purposes, including to beg, which was likely why this man was there at this particular time. He had been there begging, after all, before in times past. Verse 8 tells us that. It's also where Peter and John encountered a lame man begging in Acts chapter 3. As a blind man, he was unable to work. He had to rely on the generosity of others even to survive. Now, the immediate conclusion that his disciples made when they saw this man was that he had sinned or his parents had sinned in some way so as to warrant God punishing him for being born blind. As John MacArthur notes in the study Bible that bears his name, this was a very common understanding of the Jews of the day. That is, any and all suffering had sin as the primary or even the exclusive cause for it. Aside from the obvious question one might ask about how an unborn child would do something so heinous as to be punished in such a way, we need to admit something up front. It is very often the case that people do suffer as a result of their sin, and that the sin of parents does indeed affect the children. It happens on an individual level, and we see this in the Ten Commandments, do we not? In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 4 through 6, the second commandment, where God says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, by showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Indeed, the parent's sin does affect the children. On Sunday afternoons, we have been going through the book of Genesis. And a couple of weeks ago or so, I noted that this very thing happened because of Abraham's sin. Not once, but twice. He lied to the people and the ruler of particular nations where he went to sojourn, saying that Sarah was not his wife, but his sister. And we see a few chapters later, his son Isaac repeating the same sin, lying about Rebekah to claim the same thing. Like father, like son. Beware of this. As I said then, I'm saying it now. Parents, if you are in habitual sin and are unrepentant of it, your children are getting implicit permission from you to participate in that sin. They will do it. But it doesn't just happen on an individual level. It happens on a corporate level too. In 2 Kings 17, 6 through 8, it says this. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the last king of Israel, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes. And this occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and had feared other gods, and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel, and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. So, if you are in sin and you remain unrepentant, you should fear. God knows. What we think we do in secret is not hidden from God. And he will bring about your repentance if you are his in one way or another, and the pressure for that repentance will increase over time. Repent now before it gets worse, because if you don't, it will. And as far as the corporate issue is concerned, we ought to pray often and fervently for the repentance of our nation. Even Thomas Jefferson, one of our presidents, of course, who was known for editing a copy of the Bible so as to remove a lot of references to Jesus, knew himself that God's justice doesn't sleep forever. But I digress. So, though it is true that trouble befalls individuals and nations because of sin, it's not always the case. Pastor Kip this morning was talking about Job, and he's a great example of this. I think he provides us the greatest example, one that I, well, the greatest I can think of. God brought all of those troubles on him. Yes, Satan was the indirect cause, but go back to Job 1 and 2. Who brought up Job first? God did. Have you considered my servant Job, he said to Satan. It wasn't the devil's idea, it was God's idea. So God brought all of that on him. 
And it wasn't because he was a terrible, unrepentant rebel sinner. Repentance was something he practiced on behalf of himself and his whole family on a daily basis. But God had his reasons for afflicting Job. And interestingly, it was the same reason God had for afflicting this blind man. What was it? That's our second point. We'll get there in a moment. But you see, the disciples jumped the gun. They immediately assumed that because this man was suffering so greatly, it was due to his sin or his parents being great sinners. They should have remembered Job and not jumped to these conclusions, but rather asked questions, especially since Job's friends made the same mistake they were making. Repeatedly, we would be wise to avoid that error with one another. So we've seen the first truth, that though some sin is, the, or some rather suffering is the result of sin, not all of it is. Now we're going to see the second. The second truth is that all suffering is designed for the glory of God. All suffering is designed for the glory of God. Verses 3 through 7. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night's coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit in the ground, made mud with the saliva, and he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. How awesome this is, I don't think we grasp, because especially if we've been Christians for a while, we're very familiar with these stories. But this was a man born blind who came back seeing. With all the technology we have today, we cannot make such a person see. But yet Jesus did. Let's examine this section a piece at a time. First, Jesus flatly contradicts his disciples' assumptions, doesn't he? They said, did he sin or did his parents say? Jesus said, wrong. <laughs> You're wrong. Your assumption is incorrect. They basically said it was this man or his parents. Jesus said it was not this man or his parents. God has a purpose in this, to work his works in this man. It's like, okay, well, they're wrong. The reason what happened was the fact that God had desired to make him a display of the glory of his grace. And by the way, it's also why Paul suffered the way he did in 2 Corinthians 12, as he recalls for us. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't. I'm going to read it anyway. Verses 8 through 10 of 2 Corinthians 12. Three times, Paul says, I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. The thorn in the flesh that he talks about. He was suffering, and apparently very greatly. But he, that is God, said to him, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In the case of Paul, God was showing himself to be glorious and strong through Paul's weaknesses. And he didn't take him away either. In the case of the man born blind, he was shown glorious and strong by healing the man of his blindness. <clears throat> you see, it's up to God, not us, to determine what will glorify him more. Maybe it will be healing and deliverance. Maybe it will be sustaining us as we suffer. And when we suffer, we should indeed pray for both things. <clears throat> we should pray for healing. Because our God is able and mighty and powerful and has done it in the past. And he can do it again. But if he doesn't, what if our suffering ends in death instead of being healed? By the way, at some point, every one of us in this room is going to experience that. Eventually, we're not going to be healed in this body, in this life for the time being. Okay. What, our response, what ought our response be? And what ought we pray for as we suffer? It ought to be the same as Job. In the first half of verse 15 of Job chapter 3, I firmly believe. 
Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Great song by Shane and Shane, by the way. Though you slay me, recommend it. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Because he might. But even then, it's a blessing, isn't it? For our God doesn't need work all things together for good to those, for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. Though if he does slay us, he receives us into heaven. To him who's at right hand are pleasures forevermore, Psalm 16, awaiting the final resurrection. The fact that God is always seeking his own glory and praise, which is always the greatest good, I might add, <clears throat> is why he tells us to glorify him in all things, even the mundane, mediocre things. 1 Corinthians 10.31 testifies to this, one of my favorite Bible verses. Or whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, do it all to the glory of God. Even eating and drinking? How mundane is that? Everybody does it pretty much every day. Well, yes, even in that. In everything, we glorify God. Westminster Shorter Catechism was the chief end of man to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And that's right to make the application. What's God's chief end then? Well, it's the same. He glorifies himself. A second. Third, Jesus makes a somewhat cryptic reference to working in the daytime, coupled with the statement that he himself is the light of the world. He said that in the latter part of the conversation with the Pharisees in the last chapter. It also provides the meaning of the reference he made to light and darkness. It's true, without, they didn't have artificial lighting in those days. Working by candlelight is very tedious and difficult. So work at nighttime was nigh unto impossible in many cases, especially without a moonlight in some days. So they had to work in the daytime. But see, Jesus being the light of the world was to work while he was in the world. While he was in the world, there was light, and light was for working. <clears throat> at his death, night would fall, metaphorically speaking. And he wouldn't be doing the kinds of works that he was doing while on the earth. He was at work while he was there, and he was about to do another amazing work. So, fourth, he, provides, he performs the healing on the blind man, which, as I said, is just awesome. I find it interesting that he used saliva as part of the healing. Something he does to heal a different blind man in Mark 8. There isn't anything particularly medicinal with regard to the saliva that I'm aware of. In fact, someone might even think that it was something unclean, what he did. Why? Well, God has something to say concerning Miriam, Moses' sister, after Miriam and Aaron rebelled against Moses a bit back in Numbers chapter 12. Numbers 12, 14 says, But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face... Should she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So, getting saliva and spit on somebody's face wasn't exactly considered to be a blessed event. We still understand that, don't we? But Jesus does something with this saliva that would, something that might normally be viewed as shameful into a glorious miracle. Making mud out of it applying it to the man's eyes and telling him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Again, which means sent. Jesus, of course, being sent by God, and he sends this man to perform this washing, an act of obedience, an act of physical cleansing and symbolically spiritual cleansing, of course, as we'll talk about here in a minute. But then he had sight. Something also that's interesting with regard to the mud, we are speaking of Jesus here. Through whom was the world made, John tells us, the beginning of his gospel. The word, through Jesus and how did he first create man in his entirety? From what in Genesis 2-7? From the dust of the ground. Maybe he was providing a little bit of a hint to people. Made a whole man out of the dust of the ground before. Maybe I'll give a man new eyes in the same way. Yeah, I think that has something to do with it. And he does it again. He creates where there was not. The man had no sight. Maybe he didn't even have any eyes at all. He did then. He certainly did then. All right. That's our second truth. Let's move to the third. Though you've seen that everything is destined for God's glory, the reason he acts in any case. What's our third ob truth? Obvious truths can be hard to believe. Something else we see in this text, that obvious truths can be hard to believe. In verses 8 through 12, man's neighbors come into the scene. 
the neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar. So these are people who knew who he was, knew what he looked like, they knew his mannerisms, where he was, at what times, out next to the temple to beg. And they asked the question, didn't they? Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he's like him. He kept saying, I'm the man. I wonder how many times he had to say it before they got it through their heads. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said, where is he? He said, I don't know. So here the man was, the same man, many of them, probably even all of them, having gone to the temple many a time, I'm sure, they saw him begging, and that for years, and they could not believe it. I mean, it really was him, obviously. He looked the same, he sounded the same, and it was really obvious. They look at the man, this is the man, but they're like, no, can't be. Can't be. Impossible. He can't be seeing. Right in front of their eyes. So he kept insisting, and eventually they probably came around. And they wanted to know what you would expect them to want to know. How did this happen? He pointed to Jesus already. And this man's faith is going to grow throughout our narrative, by the way. It starts here. Now I describe the third point this way, that obvious truths can be hard to believe because of the fact that sometimes, even when the truth is staring us in the face, we don't get it. Okay, if we're honest, you know, I see people grinning out there. It's like, yeah, that's me. Yeah. We don't get it. It's, maybe it's not because we're opposed to believing it necessarily, though that does happen, and we're going to get into that here later on with the Pharisees. But for whatever reason, be it a lack of knowledge, maybe we don't have mental categories to think about certain things or whatever, we do not believe or see something that's right in front of us. Be patient with people. Because every now and then, we're the one who doesn't get it, and we understand that. So it follows from that that maybe we should be patient with others when we're trying to explain something and maybe they don't get it. Gently continue telling the truth like this man did. Help them understand. Because you're going to want them to do the same for you the next time you give them the deer in the headlights look. So he takes the time to explain. And then what do they do? Well, there's a miracle that happened here. Let's take them to the religious leaders. Let them know what took place. Because they're going to want to know this. Of course they will. In verses 13 to 16, for the fourth truth. The fourth truth we see in verses 13 to 16 this time is when our theology contradicts itself, we're wrong somewhere. When our theology contradicts itself, we are wrong somewhere. We have to be. The whole logic thing, law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be true and not true at the same time in the same respect. So if we're saying one thing here and we're saying something different over here, we need to get our theology right. And the Pharisees had that problem with regard to the Sabbath and who Jesus was in verses 13 to 16. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. A significant detail. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Hmm. Okay. But others said, how can a man who's a sinner do such signs? All right, so there's a division among them. So the idea being, Sabbath. He worked on the Sabbath. You can't work on the Sabbath. If you violate the Sabbath, you're not from God. Okay? But yet he did something so miraculous. How could he not be from God? They don't work together. There's got to be something that gives. How does it give? Well... First of all, in the case of the Pharisees, in the case of anybody, really, when our theology is contradictory in some way, we can't be okay with that. It means we're wrong, and God has given us His revelation that is indeed consistent with itself, and that what we need to do is go back into the Word of God, work through it, and seek to find out what the problem is. Study, read, pray, consult resources, talk to fellow believers. Okay, this is what I'm thinking, this is what the Word of God says, what, what am I not seeing here? See, the man's neighbors and friends in the previous verses brought him to the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of the time, you may recall. Logical course of action. Look what God did. You're all going to want to know about this. Yeah. Okay, so the Pharisees grill him. They want to know how he was healed, and he tells them exactly what he told his neighbors. But the Pharisees got hung up on something, didn't they? 
As I said, they raised the issue of the Sabbath. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. So why is this an issue? Well, most of us understand, I believe, and this is right, that we're supposed to rest on the Sabbath. That is, we're not supposed to do work. Because God worked for six days in creation, he rested on one. He assigned that to us as our responsibility in the fourth commandment. So Jesus, by healing this man, in some way, in their minds at least, he was working. And therefore, because he was working, when God said not to, he wasn't from God because he's breaking the law. That's the conclusion they reached. And yet, Jesus did heal him, didn't he? Only the power of God could accomplish something like this. So he must be from God because he healed, but he broke the Sabbath or someone from God would not do. The apparent contradiction seems obvious. Some have sought to resolve the contradiction the same way the Pharisees did. He's just not from God. Well, this has to be rejected on its face, doesn't it? I mean, there are people these days, uh, clowns like a guy by the name of Stephen Furtick, for example, that say, Jesus broke the law for love. Oh, don't give me that nonsense. Hogwash. Listen, if that were the case, we would have no salvation. Jesus could not have broken the law because he needed to live a perfect, righteous, holy life in absolute and complete obedience to the law of God, or we would have no righteousness that could be imputed to us. He did not break the law for any reason. Certainly not from some ridiculous definition of love that Stephen Furtick has. It simply doesn't work. It's impossible for God to sin on top of that, right? So what's the solution? Well, the solution is twofold. One, we need to understand the fact that Jesus, being God, has always been at work in some way, and this is no contradiction to the Sabbath. In fact, this issue came up in John chapter 5, and this is how Jesus dealt with it then. In verses 15 to 18 of chapter 5, it says this, The man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had healed him. Jesus is just going around healing these people. I mean, what's wrong with him? <laughs> he healed him, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. All right. London Baptist Confession of Faith talks about it. Catechisms address the same thing. There are basically two ways that God works out his decrees. That is, his purposes in all of history as it has existed and ever will. He does so by creation and by providence. That's it, two categories. He created put everything into existence. By providence, he keeps it in existence the way he wants it. But that requires active work on the part of God. As Colossians 1 tells us, he holds the whole universe together by his power. If God stopped holding everything together, everything would cease to exist immediately. How powerful is our God? That's part of Jesus' point here. It's like, my father's working until now, and I am working. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Again, they knew what he was saying then. But there's more to it than that. Also, referencing the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith once again, it's like a little systematic theology, a very useful document. There are certain kinds of work that are demonstrably lawful on the Sabbath day. Those kinds being what are classified as works of necessity and works of mercy. Things that we need to do and things that we should do because we wish to be compassionate and merciful to other people. Chapter 22, paragraph 8 of said confession says, The Sabbath is then kept holy unto the Lord when men, after a due preparing of their hearts and ordering their common affairs aforehand, do not only observe a holy day or holy rest all day from their own works, words, and thoughts about their worldly employment and recreations, but are also taken up the whole time in the public and private exercises of his worship and in the duties of necessity and mercy. Where did they get those, those categories? Necessity and mercy. Well, you get them from the Bible, of course. Where else are you going to get them? And they are very good with proof texts on this. The one that they use for those two categories is taken out of Matthew chapter 12, the first 12 verses. A bit of a long cross-reference, but I'm going to read it all because it addresses it perfectly and also why Jesus was, explains why he was perfectly innocent in doing what he did. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Again, this is Matthew 12, verses 1 through 12, if you wanted to turn there. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat, which, by the way, was a lawful thing to do 
according to the Old Testament law, where it says to farmers not to harvest their grain all the way out to the edges, but to leave the edges for those who are poor and who are in need so that they could come and get something to eat. Lawful. They weren't stealing. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless by offering sacrifices? Aren't they doing some sort of work? He went on from there and entered the synagogue. Or I, I, oh, back up, verse 6. I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you'd known what it means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He went on from there, entering their synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Oh, yeah, we'd all do that. Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Works that are necessary, works that are merciful. That's where it comes from. You have to eat. Some minimal preparation for it is lawful. Rescuing an animal and therefore healing someone is merciful and therefore it's lawful. We must allow the Bible to determine what we believe about the Sabbath or anything else and therefore what constitutes appropriate activity on the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath itself is a huge subject. If you want to know more about it, I preached on this a while back when we were starting out our series in Genesis in the first three verses of chapter 2. Um, it's on our YouTube channel. It's about 70 minutes long, so get a deep seat in the saddle. You want to go look it up. But we're going to move on in our text this morning with our next point, the fifth truth that we need to have a look at here from John 9. That's in verses 17 through 27. The fifth truth we need to take away from this is that we must tell what we know about Jesus. We must tell what we know about Jesus. And I want to emphasize that and say it differently. We must tell what we know about Jesus. Because we don't know everything. But we need to tell what we know. Verses 17 through 27. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, He's a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he'd been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. <laughs> his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. But the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He's of age. Ask him. Well, I mean, there's a reason why I'm using that particular tone of voice with their words. I mean, there's textual warrant interpreted for that. They were trying to get out of being in trouble. So the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, which basically means tell the truth. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, although I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? I love it. it kind of reminds me of Paul before Agrippa. Agrippa saying, would you persuade me in such a short time? <laughs> not just you, but everybody listening, Paul said. Yeah, believe. So when I say we need to tell what we know about Jesus, I mean that in two ways. First of all, we do need to go to the Scriptures and learn as much about Him as we can and be sure we seek to give a consistent testimony of who He is. This is related to the previous point about correcting our doctrine if somehow there are contradictions, and every one of us has some contradiction in some way, shape, or form. Very often we appeal to a text in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 29.29, I believe it is, when we say that the secret things belong to the Lord and the real things belong to us and to our children forever. It's like if God hasn't told us something... Okay, that belongs to him. Leave it alone. There are deep inner workings of God that we're just never going to know because he's so far beyond us. But we stop there, and that's not right, because he says that the things that are revealed are for us and for our children forever. What is revealed? Hello? 
Every word of this is revealed to us. We better know it as much as we possibly can. So we need to know as much as we can to correct our false doctrine in and of ourselves. But secondly, that's not the only point. And this, this is what's really brought out by this text. We just need to tell what we do know. No one can know everything perfectly. And the man in our text here, he was healed by Jesus. How much did he know so far? Not a lot. <clears throat> and yet God has him appear before the Pharisees, the learned theologians of the day, in a synagogue to testify what he does know. Brothers and sisters, you don't need to be a Ph.D. theologian to testify of Jesus and tell others about him. And by the way, not just tell about him, but urge them to trust him. This guy was asking if they wanted to trust Jesus and become his disciples by the end of verse 27. Isn't that awesome? I mean, what did he know about him so far? He openly admits he doesn't have the answers, by the way. He doesn't try to fabricate anything. And there's an important lesson for us here about this, too. If you don't know something, regardless of who you're talking to, then simply say so. It might help to practice, by the way. Say, I don't know. It's okay. All of us don't know some things. And some of us don't know a lot of things. The more I learn, the more I realize I don't know sometimes. But see, so, so say a raging atheist gets up in your face. He demands that you reconcile two verses in Scripture that you really haven't thought about before. What do you tell him? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I mean, I don't know. Oh, then there's no answer for it. Well, no, I'm sure there is an answer for it. I just don't know what it is right now. I mean, I'm happy to look it up for you and get back to you. I'll probably ignore you and walk off at that point because they're really not interested in learning most of the time. But how does our guy here do this? And the Pharisees claimed that Jesus was a sinner, didn't they? We read it. The answer is yes. Of course, we know that he wasn't. But we have a lot more theology than this man had. He didn't even know at the time when they asked him, this man is a sinner, like, I don't know if he is or not. That seems kind of basic. But he didn't know, so he said so. He said, I don't know, but I know this. He opened my eyes. I mean, I've been a Christian for 30 years now, over that even. I've been through the Bible a lot. I've read it a lot. I've studied and learned a lot. But I still have a lot more studying and learning to go. And this guy, he knew a little bit about Jesus. Certainly didn't know him for 30 years. Probably closer to 30 minutes, maybe a few hours. But he still had something to say, didn't he? And so do you. Trust God that he will use it, because he does. And he did with this man. Boy, did he ever. Perfect knowledge is by no means required. And yes, you're not going to know some things, and yes, you're going to make mistakes, but God uses that in glorious ways. And also, notice how this man's faith is increasing. Before it's like he was talking to his neighbors, yeah, there's this Jesus. He's the one who did it. I don't know where he is. And then he comes before the Pharisees, and they ask him, what do you know about him? Well, he's a prophet. All right, better. Was Jesus a prophet? Yes. He was also a high priest and a king and more. God himself. Is he more than a prophet? Yes, but he's not less than a prophet. And notice also that the Pharisees called his parents to testify about him, to verify that this indeed was their son and that he was born blind. Nothing wrong with this per se. Get extra testimony, verify what's going on. This is fine. This is good. But as we have discovered, their motivation was a bit less than pure. I'll have more detail of that here in a few verses. But I also want you to note the response of the parents and why they responded the way they did. We alluded to that briefly already. We do not have to wonder why they were evasive. John tells us. They didn't give a direct answer because they were afraid. Afraid of whom? Afraid of the Jews, the text says. Who are these Jews? It's the Jewish hierarchy, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authority of the day is what we're talking about. Why? Because they had a pronouncement. The pronouncement being they would get put out of the synagogue if they affirmed that Jesus was the Christ. Throw them out. Okay, this is, by the way, not just an issue of being shoved out the door because somebody was making a bit of a rambunctious mess in your lobby or whatever. It's like, okay, you can leave now. Maybe come back later. It's not what this is about. Think of this in terms of being akin to being cut off from your people. In the law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, we see this kind of terminology as being cut off as a punishment for heinous sins. And it was more than just being shunned. 
It was the idea of being removed from God's presence, being removed from the altar. And without the sacrificial system, where's your hope? So being put out here wasn't just told to leave, maybe keep six feet away, post some signs or something, get a restraining order. That wasn't the idea. This was serious. And the threat of that made him afraid. It's either the truth. Yeah, he's our son. Yeah, he was healed. Yeah, Jesus did it. Or access to the synagogue. Well, he's of age, ask him. His parents chose poorly. It wasn't like in this video series that I saw years ago. I think Family Life put it out on VHS. If you don't know who, what a VHS is, that's fine. Those of us with gray hair in here do. But they, they did a, a cartoon account of this, and his parents were all bold and brave. Like, we will never deny that this is what has happened to him. I was like, that's not what happened. Come on, read John 9. They were afraid. What did our guy choose? He doubled down, didn't he? They asked him again, like his parents suggested. What did he say? He said, I told you. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciple too? His faith increases again. Not just a prophet. I mean, in the course of the discussion, he's a prophet. But you need to follow this man. So he told what he knew about Jesus. Do the same. Do it a lot. Moving on to the sixth truth. So on number six, we have eight. We're still moving. The sixth truth is false presuppositions will make even brilliant theologians very wrong. False presuppositions, false pre-commitments and false ideas will make even really smart theologians to be wrong. That's verses 28 to 34, which say, and they reviled him. You are his disciple we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. He do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? Maybe just a little bit of arrogance there. Maybe a little. They cast him out. The very thing his parents were afraid of. But he kept going. See, these men did know the Scriptures very well. These Pharisees. They were the brilliant theologians of the day, but it ultimately didn't matter. Because they were entrenched in unbelief. They already were committed not to believe in Jesus. And they reviled this man, who was not only miraculously healed, testifying that, yeah, Jesus was from God, which they refused to acknowledge. But they mocked him for pointing them to Jesus. <laughs> Note what they said. They followed Moses, they said. Oh, way to go. We know where Moses was from. Yeah, you know where he was from. But we know where this Jesus is from as if they're mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive. By the way, brothers and sisters, I'm a disciple of Moses and of Jesus. And if you're truly a Christian, so are you. Because you believe everything Moses wrote and everything Jesus said. But the truth, the truth is, with regard to the Pharisees here, they weren't even followers of Moses. They thought they were, but they were wrong. They were self-deceived. Because if they truly were followers of Moses, they would have believed in Jesus and followed him. Here's why. Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19. One of the most important things Moses wrote down with regard to Jesus himself. Verses 15 through 19 of chapter 18. Deuteronomy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. They were afraid of the fire on the mountain. They needed someone to come down to them. And the Lord said to me, They're right in what they've spoken. 
I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. That's a threat and a promise of judgment. They really didn't follow Moses then, did they? No. Because Moses said to believe Jesus. And Moses recorded what God himself had said. That if they would not, then he required of them. They condemned themselves with their own words. They didn't follow God. But they claimed it. They're really smart. They knew their Bible, so to speak, didn't they? Hmm. Think about it. You all understand, um, by way of application, that we, we do have a real enemy, a spiritual enemy. You know, there's, there's such thing as the devil. There really is a real devil, real demons, that sort of thing. I mean, I'm convinced beyond any shadow of a doubt in my mind that so much of the madness that is going on in our society these days with completely turning themselves on the created order is demonically inspired. They're still guilty of sin, people doing these things, of course, but pushed on by wicked spiritual forces. I have no doubt of that. But you know what? Satan and his demons know the Bible better than we do. They really do. And they'll misuse it, and they'll abuse it, and they'll tell people, and they'll convince people that the using and abusing of Scripture is actually the right way to understand it. You encounter pretty frequently. And there are a lot of people who are given into sin who know their Bibles pretty well. They might even know it better than you, but they won't use it right. So know it well, use it properly. But I love this man's response that he gives to these Pharisees. This man was a know-nothing nobody of it by anybody's standard. But he schools the Pharisees about the obvious truth that was staring them in the face, that they refused to believe because of their sinful bias against Jesus. They are already pre-committed to reject it. I really do like what John MacArthur says about it. I'm just going to quote it from his study Bible. It says, The healed man demonstrated more spiritual insight and common sense than all of the religious authorities combined who sat in judgment of Jesus and him. His penetrating wit focused in on their intractable unbelief. His logic was that such an extraordinary miracle could only indicate that Jesus was from God. For the Jews believed that God responds in proportion to the righteousness of the one praying. The greatness of the miracle could only indicate that Jesus was actually from God. End quote. And how great was the miracle? What this man said about it was accurate. Go through the entire Bible up to this point. Go back and read it all. You do it a lot, but... Read it all with this particular aspect in mind. Do we see any time in there a man born blind who was healed of his blindness? Nope. I mean, there are miracles that are recorded. Moses did a few, Elijah, Elisha, that sort of thing. We see miracles, but you don't see this. So he says, it's never been heard of this has happened before. He was right. Jesus did it. Wow. Who could this be but God? Obvious answer, well, it has to be God. It was glorious. This man was 100% correct, and it's something the Pharisees shouldn't have had any trouble believing at all, considering they knew the Scriptures better than he did, but they didn't believe. I've been using this phrase for many years, ever since I was teaching a Sunday school class at Pleasant Heights Baptist Church over a decade ago, uh, on the book of Jonah. Sin makes you stupid. I mean, it makes us really stupid. And, and Jonah, being a prophet of God, another guy would have known the Word of God really well, right? He decides that he doesn't want to do what God said and go preach at Nineveh, so he gets on a boat, that's made out of wood that God made, and gets on the notion that God made and his control over, and he thinks he's going to run away and get away from God. What? Okay, if anybody in Israel knew better than that, it was Jonah. But for whatever reason, at the time when he was in sin and rebelling against God's command, he thought it was a good idea. Did he really think it was a good idea? Yeah, he did. Think about it when you're sitting and not wanting to hear the truth that God is telling you, either from the Word or conviction you have in your soul, or from the rebuke of a brother or sister. Because at one particular time, the reason you're sitting is because something in you wanted to do it. And you're dedicated to it to one degree or another. And when somebody pushes back against you, you're like, well, that's, no, 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 what I'm doing actually, that it does seem like a good idea. No! <laughs> but sin makes us stupid. They made the Pharisees stupid. 
And when we're in sin, we do find the most foolish ways and excuses not to believe God on something or to continue participating in our sinful actions. And we do think that it's a good idea at the time. Absolute foolishness. May God deliver us from such. God help us all. And lastly, in this particular set of verses, we note that they have the same false presupposition about the man's blindness that Jesus' disciples did, all the way back at the beginning of chapter 9. What did they say? Was it his parents or was it him? The Pharisees. You were steeped in great sin, they said. No, that's not why it happened. I mean, maybe they didn't hear Jesus' explanation, but anyway, I don't think even if they had heard it, they would have believed him in the first place. I mean, some things never do change. They were refuted, the Pharisees were, by a completely unlearned man. And instead of humbling themselves, which they ought to have done, they asked the question, would you teach us? Yes, yes he did, and you need to believe him. They shouted him down instead, and they repeated a falsehood about him, and then they threw him out. Let's see, loudly shouting people down, shouting falsehoods out, and they really don't make any sense, refusing to believe in Jesus. I mean, that never happens anymore, does it? Goodness sakes, that's the M.O. of the people today, broadcast loudly across media and social media. And we think to ourselves, how can they do this? It's been going on like forever. People that are steeped in sin, refusing to repent, that's what they do. Because they want to suppress the knowledge of God and unrighteousness. And when we're speaking the truth, but for the acting of the Spirit of God, which we should pray for earnestly, they won't believe. They can't. So pray and speak the truth. So when, not if, but when this happens to you, you're in good company. Right? Happened to Jesus himself multiple times, let's not forget. It also demonstrates again that the Bible is true because the Bible records the same thing happening again and again. You're doing exactly what the Bible says people in your situation do. You're just confirming the truth of the Word of God while you're denying it. Can't escape it. And then be encouraged. Isn't that what Matthew 5 tells us? That they, in the same way they persecuted the prophets who are before you, we should be encouraged by that. We're in good company. Seventh truth. Jesus is God. Spelled out so clearly because of what this man does in verses 35 to 38. Jesus heard they'd cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. That's a big deal. He worshipped him. This man got cast out of the synagogue. We know what this implies. We talked about that already. He testified to what he knew. He did so boldly. He didn't back down. He didn't care what happened to him. He was going to speak the truth. Oh, Lord God, give us that kind of confidence. And look what happened. God didn't leave him. Didn't leave him rejected. God himself, Jesus Christ, came to him and comforted him. Glorious. Glorious. And God will do that for you. I mean, he's not going to show up in bodily form and walk over and pat you on the head or something. But he will, by the Spirit of God, in you, comfort you. Jesus revealed himself to the man fully. And look at the result. His faith comes to fruition. He fully trusted in Jesus, and as a result, he worshipped him. Kind of like Thomas did after the resurrection, my Lord and my God which isn't an exclamation or swearing or something, as you'll hear from Muslims. And they, yeah, they do say that. He wasn't reacting in shock. He's saying, the Lord of me and the God of me. That's what the text literally says with regard to Thomas's confession. And this man here worshipped Jesus. We never get to know his name. You see that? He never gives his name here. We just know him as the guy Jesus saved, who testified to him and worships him. Most of, I mean, history records a few things, but most people in history never get their name printed anywhere. But yet there are plenty of faithful followers of Christ in that. We should be okay with that. But he worshipped him. By the way, Jesus received that worship. He didn't back away from it at all. This is significant. And also it testifies to the faith of this man, a Jewish man growing up. There's but one God. Oh, that is repeated, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This man would have known that, but he's worshiping this Jesus, which means he understands him to be the one true God. There's no other way to explain that. Not an angel, because what happens when angels were going to receive worship? John, I, John, Revelation 22, 8 and 9. Revelation 22, 8 and 9. John, same guy that wrote this 
uh, letter, this, uh, this gospel, the Apostle John. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. Oops. Not good. What does the angel do? No! He said, you must not do that! I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God, the angel said. It's like, I'm a creature like you. I'm a servant like you. I'm not God. Worship God. And, but Jesus didn't do that. When this man worshiped him, he received it. Very significant. And texts like this are how we formulate the doctrine of the Trinity, by the way, that we have one God, one being who is God, but, who has, but there are three separate persons, neither of whom is each other. But they eternally share the one being of God without division. Man, that's confusing. Yeah, it is. We're trying to talk about the nature of God. There's only so much that he's shown us and how much our minds can comprehend. Jesus is God. How about that title, Son of Man? Remember Jesus asked him, who's the Son of Man? What's that talking about? Well, it's not so much referring to his humanity, though you might think so, though it does do this a little bit, but it's actually a divine title. From Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days. Son of man, Ancient of Days. The son, the Ancient of Days. Jesus, the Father, right? And was presented before him, and to him, that is, to the Son of Man, was given dominion and glory in the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Oh, yes. If we're in Christ, we're part of that kingdom, and his kingdom is not going to be destroyed. Amen. And see, this Son of Man gets dominion and a kingdom and rulership. Everything is going to serve him. He gets glory. God doesn't share his glory with anybody. He says that elsewhere in the prophets. You know that, right? But yet this Son of Man gets glory? From the ancient of days, the Son of Man must be God. And Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who? He's standing before you. And then receives the man's worship. Because you worship the Son of Man. That's our Jesus. He showed who he truly was to this man. The result was worship as it must be. Obvious application, brothers and sisters. Worship this Jesus. He is the Son of Man in Daniel 7. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. He rules heaven and earth, and He is your King and your God. Lastly, our eighth truth. And then we'll close. The eighth truth is this. Denying our blindness shows our guilt. Denying our blindness shows our guilt. It's verses 39 to 41. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Who's the one who didn't see? Well, this man, in more ways than one. Physically blind, spiritually blind. God opened his eyes physically and spiritually, and now he sees. But how about those who see may become blind? Ironically, the next people to speak are the Pharisees. Well, I wonder who he was talking about. The Pharisees heard him, near him, heard him say these things and said to him, are we also blind? Man, Jesus was a lot more patient than I would have been. Like My response like, you think? <laughs> who do you think I was talking about? He said, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. Now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Maybe a little cryptic. Of course, we're not just talking about physical blindness. Jesus opens eyes spiritually that we might see him. He did both of those things for this man, physical and spiritual. He didn't do it for the Pharisees, and therefore they remained blind, which is what Jesus' last statement here means. He was not making a blanket statement about people's spiritual status if they never heard the gospel. Some people take it that way, like they've never heard. And so they remain blind, but they're not guilty because they've never heard the gospel. That's not what he's saying at all. No. The point is, had the Pharisees admitted their spiritual blindness... Saying, yes, this Jesus is from God. Yeah, we're followers of Moses. Moses talked about this man. It must be him. Even though you're telling us learned theologians, 
what we really ought to have admitted in the first place. You're right, we're wrong. If they'd done that, then they wouldn't have been blind anymore. It would have been the work of God in them, would it not? Had they repented of their sinful rebellion, they'd finally see the truth, believing in Jesus. But you see, they arrogantly shouted down our guy in this text, didn't they? They remained convinced that they saw things clearly apart from Jesus. And therefore, they remained spiritually blind. Jesus is not fooled. They denied their blindness, and they proved their guilt. That's what he means. Brief recap of what we talked about this morning then in our text in John 9. First, we saw that not all suffering is the direct result of sin. Might be, might not be. Pray, study. All suffering is designed for the glory of God. Every bit of it. Obvious truths can be hard to believe. I wonder how many times the man told them that he was indeed the man poor blind before they believed him. When our theology contradicts itself, we are wrong somewhere. We shouldn't be okay with that. When we are called to testify, in whatever situation it is, we must tell what we know about Jesus. Tell what we know. Don't tell what you don't. If you don't know it, say so. But tell what you do. This man didn't know much, but boy, was his testimony powerful. And we're still reading about it 2,000 years later. False presuppositions will make even brilliant theologians very wrong. They were committed not to believe Jesus, and it colored everything that they said and did in their actions. And let us not forget number seven, Jesus is God. He received worship. Only God rightly received worship. And then denying our blindness shows our guilt. So, if and when you do not understand the truth of Scripture, or if you still remain in your sin and somehow think that you're going to be okay, raised up in a Christian home, learning all sorts of things, well, maybe you are kind of like the Pharisees and know quite a bit. But um, you're still blind and even trusted Jesus. And denying it only increases guilt. So I'd urge you to call out to God today. If there's something in, in you, the Word that you have been struggling with that you're struggling to believe, even as a Christian, like, I don't understand, that's really hard. But that's what God has said. Pray that he would help you believe it. And turn to Christ for the first time or once again. Let's pray together and we'll finish out our service this morning. Our Lord and God, you truly are great. Lord Jesus, you do open blind eyes. For those of us who are in you, you have opened our eyes. And it is you who did